Hi everybody and welcome to week six. Uh, I can't believe that we're already halfway through the term. Uh, this week we're actually going to be looking at uh, curriculum design, syllabus design, and needs analysis for second language writing courses. And there were two pieces that I asked everybody to read. One was the, the chapter out of Ferris and Hitchcock, which kind of gives a broad overview of all of the issues. And then the second piece was uh, from Alistair Cumming, which was some uh, research that he did around second language writing and uh, and teacher's practices, and that came from a collection of interviews uh, he did, uh, like 48 to 50 interviews, I believe. So before I get to that, to talk more about that, um, there were a couple things around housekeeping I wanted to do, some announcements, and then to say a few words about the posts from this past week on World Englishes. So in terms of announcements, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, responding to me so quickly uh, regarding Nina's request whether you were going to be around next term or not or where in the program you were so she can make uh, program decisions. Thank you very much. I will send that all off to her. Uh, also, th thank you for sending me your, your, uh, your critiques, your textbook critiques. I will read them and get them back to you in about a week or so, probably by this weekend or early next week. And the third thing, uh, you know, I apologize for all of that darn work I gave you last week, I realized it was like the perfect storm. All of these things came together. And uh, so I appreciate your patience and being so gracious. No one said anything to me. So um, no one complained or was, uh, was uh, kind of put off by it. But I hope I didn't create any unnecessary stress. I certainly didn't mean to. And I will be more careful uh, with assignments in the future. So you know, I was certainly impressed that you were able to write and read and respond and comment on, on people's uh, uh, papers and so forth, all in that term. So I certainly uh, appreciate all of your hard work you did last week. And I hope that you found the peer feedback that you, that you got and received was very useful. And I hope the opportunity of actually looking at how other people compose their texts was very beneficial to making your own piece a bit stronger. So um, I hope you enjoyed the activity. And the last thing I wanted to say was to kind of quickly reflect on uh, World Englishes. There was a flurry of different uh, posts in the last couple of days, and I'm sorry that this, I'm sorry for uh, not being able to respond to everything and that this podcast is a bit late, but I've been traveling and I just got back last night, so I'm still playing catch up. Um, but I just wanted to point out some things that I saw that came up that might be um, you know, kind of worth, worth talking about. So keep in mind, um, so first, I'm glad that everybody enjoyed World Englishes. I mean, it was great to see that um, people were getting involved and engaged and kind of taking positions or still being somewhat confused and baffled by this whole issue and not really sure where to stand. Well, the, you're not alone. Many people feel that way if they know about this at all. There are many people who don't know about World Englishes or Lingua Franca English. Um, it's probably about 15 or 20 years old, the, sort of the discipline itself. And uh, there are already some journals, uh, like World English's Journal. Uh, so there are certain men, you know, publishers who actually uh, publish pieces in this area. But uh, it's still somewhat on the margins. But there is actually going to be a conference this May in Istanbul on lingua franca English. So it's sort of the World English's crowd, if you will. And the whole um, theme is on pedagogy and World English's. So maybe some of the questions that came up from the posts this past week will be answered at this. And I submitted a paper to it. Uh, I don't know if it's been accepted or not, but I'd really like to go and kind of get some answers uh, to some of these. So I think many of you were kind of concerned, well, you know, it's, it seems like an interesting idea and it seems like something that we're ready to try out and explore, but how do you teach it? How do you even approach it? And Unfortunately, I don't think there are any answers to that. In fact, uh, Shresh Kanagraja, in his book, I've got it here, I was pulling it out for you guys. Um, let me get it in here. Critical Academic Writing in Multilingual Students, which is a great book if you have, if you have time. Uh, he goes more into uh, his beliefs uh, behind writing and, and approaches to it, so on and so forth. He basically says, well, you know, pedagogically it's difficult because there really isn't any um, quote-unquote standard for World Englishes yet in terms of teaching it and addressing it in the classroom. Uh, that takes time. It takes scholars to, to explore it and teachers to experiment with it. 
And given that it's, you know, it's, it's a non-standard, there's certainly, you know, teachers have limitations in that sense. You know, the institution may not allow it, the curriculum may have no space for it, uh, may not want to make any space for it. There may be resistance from other teachers. There may be resistance from parents if you're working with adolescents or children. Um, or you may be re find resistance from the students themselves who may not be interested in it. So those are certainly, you know, vary from context to context, so you have to consider that as well. Also, what does World Englishes mean in Canada versus in places like Sri Lanka, where Shresh Kanagaraja is from, or Malaysia, where uh, Liu is from. And Liu is actually one of the researchers uh, Shresh Kanagaraja cites in his book. And she wrote a, uh, uh, an article, uh, she did some research, and she published an article, and I'm attaching it with this podcast called uh, Prof professing Multiculturalism, the Politics of Style in the Contact Zone. And she looks at an example where a student wrote the phrase can, able to, I believe. And can, able to in this student's context actually meant something very specific. And even though in standard English it's ungrammatical to say can, able to, I, for example, I can, able to uh, draft a paper or something like that. So the in this article, and it's been a while since I read it, but if I recall, they spent some time negotiating it and talking about it. And then another alternative form emerged, such as may, as in I may be able to do it or something like that. And the student agreed that that form represented what um, he or she was looking for. But can able to for the student was something very specific that the standard form just normally really didn't uh, capture. So that might be, if you're interested in like looking at how World English works with syntax, that may be a very, uh, syntax and, and grammar, that might be an interesting example to look at. So, um, again, thank you so much for those very interesting posts and comments. And we may not be able to answer everybody's question today, but the seed has been planted and you can certainly um, keep thinking and developing and reading more about it. If you're interested in doing some activities in class, um, you know, and if you can, if there are no other limitations, then I don't see why not. Uh, certainly doing free writes in standard, um, or home languages rather, and uh, second dialects is, I think, perfectly fine. You can also couch things around in terms of language awareness activities where students do some type of register shifting. So you could give students an academic text uh, that's written in standard English and have them revise it into their uh, second dialect, if you will and have them compare and contrast the differences, or vice versa. So you're getting some sense of um, how they're distinguishing between the two varieties of English, and are they able to talk about the grammar, the lexical choice, punctuation choice. I mean, it may be a great activity just to start thinking about language and varieties of language and context around language. Um, and it's certainly a way to start talking about genre and writing. But again, it's something that you have to kind of think about if it's possible in your context, given what you may be allowed to do in your classroom. So again, thank you so much for those, uh, those comments and it certainly made me think about it and, and rethink my own position on it as well. So uh, we're running out of time. So just briefly with the articles for this week, on page three of uh, Alistair Cummings' article, he asks these questions, which I think would be great for everybody to reflect on as you are responding. And so those questions were the research questions that he asked the second language writing teachers. And that was, how is the curriculum for ESL or EFL writing organized at your institution? And you can change ESL or EFL to be, you know, to French or Italian or whichever language is relevant for you. Uh, could you describe a typical syllabus for an ESL or EFL writing course at your institution? Please select, please select one course that you usually teach. Uh, how are students typically assessed in their ESL or EFL writing? So you could choose maybe one or two of those, reflect on them, talk, talk to us about them, maybe relate them back to the material, to, to how the teachers in Alistair Cummings' article responded, or to the advice that Ferris and Hedgecock give us on writing. Um, so there it is. And again, thank you so much for your patience and I really uh, appreciated the readings and the responses around um, uh, critical writing and world Englishes, and I look forward to reading everybody's responses this week. Take care. Bye-bye.